Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast presented by Trainer Road, where we interview successful athletes to make you a faster cyclist. And I'm joined by James Dunleap out of Maple Grove, Minnesota today. How's it going, James? Fantastic. You reached out to be on this podcast. You did so at trainerroad.com slash SAP. Anybody listening to this, this is how you can uh, get on here and share your story. We'd love to hear how Trainer Road helped you be successful. And when you did it, uh, there we get many, uh, many requests all the time, many submissions. And I love reading them all. And yours really struck a, a chord with me. And I think it's really important that we discuss uh, many things today. But we're going to discuss the intersection of mental health and endurance sport. It's so complex, you know, in a, in a world where we thrive, you know, we, we thrive and pride ourselves even on being able to push through pain and go through all this stuff. And um, but there's there's more to it than that. And we're going to discuss that. So but before we do that, I just want to get into the athlete you are, first of all. So you uh, do triathlon as well as mountain bike racing, as well as all sorts of stuff. Uh, you've used Trainer Road to increase your FTP over 60 percent. So we're talking from the 190s up to just above 300 watts, which is hugely impressive. Uh, and you're roughly now somewhere around three watts per kilogram, depending on the day. That's that's a, a, a huge success. So I want to talk about your context, when you train, that sort of stuff, kind of those details. And then I want to get into the discussion of the, the more complex management of all of those details with, with yeah. mental health. So um, what was your background with sport, uh, James, and how'd you get into cycling? So I, I guess if we go way back, um, you know, played soccer a lot in high school, loved it, um, ironically hated running. Um, but you know, if I had a ball to chase, I always joke, I'm like a golden retriever. So the, you know, with the ball to chase, it was a very enjoyable sport. Um, and then, you know, kind of through, through my twenties, you know, with decisions around, you know, career pursuits, education, um, really got disconnected from the, uh, you know, from any kind of sports, any kind of phys physical activity, I gained a lot of weight. Um, and then I would say kind of into my early thirties reconnected with mountain biking when I'd found out there were miles and miles and miles of beautifully maintained single track trails, you know, just about right out my back door, um, and started doing that a lot more. And I remember, I still remember my first ride finishing like four miles and thinking like, oh my goodness, that was intense. There's no way anybody could go longer than that. And then learning, in fact, people do go a lot further than that. And that kind of <laughs> lit a fire with my competitive side that I had lost oh. touch with. And, um, you know, it just, it, it made me want to get faster and be better. Yeah. So it's, um, many people enjoy mountain biking for just the, the general, like the thrill of riding the trails themselves. For you, it was more of a competitive aspect, reigniting something that you had lost. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, like I, I just, I had no real competitive outlets at that point. And, you know, I guess I had just lost touch with how important that was to me. Um, and I'm, it's people tease me about it a lot, but it's all in good spirit. I'm a very like, you know, process oriented person and, and can be kind of meticulous with sometimes the weirdest things. Um, and so like getting in and learning more about like training and how to train and like there's, you can have a whole process around it. It was, um, it was enticing. So that would have been in 2016 that a lot of that kicked off. Um, and then, you know, where, where we, where I live, um, the trails get closed, uh, when it rains and we had a, a particularly wet summer, um, which led to buying a road bike because I wanted to keep riding more often. And, you know, it just wasn't, I couldn't go as fast on the mountain bike on the roads and, you know, why not have more than one bike? Um, and so the, you know, riding on the roads in the summer and then on a stationary trainer in the winter, um, that next spring, a friend of mine asked if I would want to do, you know, kind of a local, uh, medio fondo. So 50 mile ride. I said, sure. I, I've been like 15 miles. This will be a piece of cake. Um, <laughs> and I finished, uh, it wasn't the most pleasant of experiences, but it, uh, I was, I was totally hooked. Um, and that was, so that was 2017. And that was sort of my gateway into triathlon, uh, because mm. later that summer went and did a 5k with that same friend. And he was like, well, at this point you might as well come do a triathlon with me. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, I've swam once or twice. This will be fun. Um, I love that how was... that works with a lot of triathletes, by the way. They're like, so you've ridden a bike, so you might as well do a triathlon. You've done one of three. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, there's a ton yeah. of crossover. You know how to run. Yeah. And you know, as long as you don't drown, <laughs> anyone can finish a sprint. <laughs> sounds, yeah, yeah, it sounds like it, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that was, that was a unique experience. Um, you know, the, I mean, the, the course was beautiful. I still, that's one of my favorite tries to do. Um, but you know, the swim was an exercise and don't die. 
Um, the bike was far and away the best leg. And then the run was like, just please try really hard not to walk. Um, but I was totally hooked after that. And so that was sort of the gateway into triathlon at that point. So what do you identify with a specific type of riding or endurance sport? Like, do you think of yourself as a triathlete or a mountain biker? I think I used to more than I do now. Um, you know, it's, I, I think I started out like really identifying as a mountain biker and then, you know, road cycling and triathlon was just a vehicle to improve, um, the mountain biking. But now it's just, um, you know, I've kind of, I've shifted and drifted more towards, you know, triathlon. And I think some of that is I end up doing a lot of riding alone and training alone. Um, and we'll, we'll probably touch on it later, but that's part of the mental separation that I've built for myself to have, um, you know, a healthier relationship with sport. Um, but because I end up doing a lot of it alone, um, I just, you know, identify if anything, maybe it's more of a time trialist, yeah. but in, in general, it's just somebody, somebody that enjoys cycling and, and likes to be outside and on a bike and, you know, appreciate the social aspects of the sport for what they are when they're available. Interesting that you point out the common thread of a time trialist. Uh, I think many mountain bikers look at the Tour de France and when they see the time trial day, when people are in, in the aero bars and with their aero helmets and the skin suits, they think that's the furthest thing from me. However, it is very similar uh, in terms of execution, right? It's yeah. Uh, instead of you against the clock, it's more you against the trail, and you're just doing all that you can to be able to get through it. And that's, mm -hmm. It is actually very similar, and and people with steady power tend to do very well with mountain biking, even though it's perceived as being punchy and surgy. That steady yeah. power pays dividends. It absolutely. I mean, there's there's the the element of the punchiness and the surginess that you know, that makes mountain biking intense and fun. Um, and I, I love that aspect of it, but it's, you know, kind of what happens between the punchy and surgy parts and mm -hmm. between the descents, being able to just, you know, roll the power on and hold it and just keep cruising. I mean, it's, it's a time trial between punches. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely is. So, uh, in this process of going about and doing triathlons or mountain biking and then getting into road stuff and triathlons, when did you start using trainer road and what was the motive behind that? Uh, you know, this structured approach, you mentioned that you perhaps tend to lean that way naturally. Mm -hmm. So I started just kind of, you know, what can I find on YouTube in, you know, like 2017, 2018. Um, I did some spin classes, but it just, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was getting the benefit that I was looking for. And a lot of it being an analyst at heart, um, there wasn't a lot of data being collected to say, you know, can I track some measure of improvement, even if it's not, you know, absolute watts sustained over a period of time, there's always something to find that allows you to say, yeah, I improved a little bit here today. And that's something I can celebrate. Um, and so there was a, a guy that I was, I took some classes with that I follow on Strava and he was training for an Ironman. And I remember seeing on Strava, the graphs of the trainer road workouts. And it was like that, that's it. That is, that is the kind of like meticulous approach that like calls to me. Um, and so I looked into it, did the, did the free trial and started in January of 2019. Um, I believe it was, and that was sort of the, you know, the baseline from there and, you know, 2019 kind of turned into a, a really weird and tough year for me. It actually fortunately made 2020 a lot easier to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, it was, it was very inconsistent over the course of 2019, but was able to address a lot of, um, you know, underlying emotional issues, I would say that um, I was able to leverage that kind of personal growth and like getting in touch with and, and solving some of those problems to, um, you know, really come out and understand what is it like to have a healthier relationship with sport and how can I grow as an athlete and as a person um, in ways that I wouldn't have been able to without that work on self. Yeah. You know, that's in, so this is kind of opens the gateway to, to have this larger conversation here because, um, structured work, structured training, and, and many cases people wouldn't see it as some sort of like an, an avenue or, or a clarifying tool to be able to solve the rest of the other, uh, things that we battle with in our lives. In many cases, it's seen as a, as further complexity added in. Um, and, and in fact, actually on that note really quick, what, what do you do for work? And, and let's talk about the logistics of fitting the training into your life and then we can get into to all the other details. 
Yeah, so I work in um, like data governance and reporting and analytics right now. So, you know, sticking with the, the love of data and numbers, um, <laughs> that's kind of my day in, day out job, I would say, over the, the course of the pandemic. Um, it it was actually fairly easy to fit the training in um, with working from home. Um, you know, I, I had the latitude to, you know, well, if I want to do a workout around lunchtime, that's OK. You just make sure you get, you know, get the time in, get the work done. Nobody, nobody complains as long as you're delivering what you're expected to deliver, um, which, you know, it was, I, I think early on, I tried to fit everything in before work. So those really early morning workouts and they, they just don't work well for me. Like I can get through it. I can suffer through it. But, um, you know, I found going you know, around like lunchtime, early afternoon, um, that's, you know, where, you know, I'm fueled and kind of warmed up and I'm in a, in a headspace where I'm ready for a little break in the middle of the day. I just, I found I had the most success with being consistent and being able to complete workouts effectively, um, around that, you know, midday or, or in the evening time as, as family obligations allow. There's more to, uh, doing the workouts than just checking the box of compliance, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, um, there's more you get from it. Yeah. It's so you know, there's, there's the, the sense of accomplishment there. I mean, to a certain extent, there is the, you know, the sense of like checking the box, but what I found was, um, you know, by having my structured training kind of in the middle of the day separated or even early morning, evening, whenever time allows, but, you know, having that structured workout to say, this is when I'm focusing on improvement. It allowed me to kind of engage with cycling and appreciate cycling and running in a way that I wasn't able to before. Um, I'm going to borrow an expression from uh, a guy that I worked with that would mountain bike with us. And, you know, he always referred to it as playing bikes. Like he had raced a lot and he said, if I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done racing and if I'm going to go ride a bike, it's because I want to play bikes because it's fun. And so by mm -hmm. carving out and dedicating the time to structured training separate from you know, going mountain biking with friends, going on a group ride, riding to a cafe in the morning, you know, with uh, with the family to, to have breakfast on a weekend. Uh, you know, I could appreciate those for what they are without expectations around. I have to hold a certain power. This has to be a certain duration, a certain distance. Like there's no expectations other than I'm going to go enjoy some time outside doing something I love with people that I like and just appreciate the moment for what it is. Yeah, that's a really healthy way to manage it. If you can compartmentalize it like that, it allows the bike to still be the outlet that you need in both respects, you know? Yeah. Um, let's talk about, so the, the balance side and the mental health side of things. It, being a very data-focused person, being that that is your world, have you faced the danger of becoming like too obsessive over the details and where training actually becomes detrimental to you? Yeah. Um, and that, so that was a lot of the work that I did in 2019, um, you know, kind of unwinding some of that. Um, you know, it, I think probably in 2018 when, you know, I got my, my, I think it was 2018, I got my first Garmin watch. And so now it's like data at the fingertips and I have, you know, I don't have power yet, but I have speed and cadence and I'm starting to get more metrics. I would go out mountain biking with friends and I would come home and my wife would ask me like, how was your ride? And it got to a point where it was like, well, I don't know. I haven't looked at the numbers yet. Like I'd become mm -hmm. so focused on, you know, did I hit certain performance objectives dictating whether or not I had a good ride that I'd really lost touch with just being able to go out and enjoy the local trails to enjoy, you know, a ride, you know, around, around a neighborhood or, or downtown to have breakfast with a friend. Um, and so in, you know, in 2019, things kind of really came to a head um, from an emotional perspective. I was using endurance sport as kind of a, you know, like we, we push through the pain, we push through the discomfort, um, you know, because we, you know, there's, there's a point of pride around it. It's, you know, I think it's along the lines of how much pride so many people take and how much work they can do on so few calories. Like it's, it's something that people outside of the sport will especially look at in my experience and, you know, like, wow, that's, that's toughness. That's something impressive. And, um, you know, I had used the training more than anything else as kind of a way to hide from my own problems. Um, so dealing with depression, anxiety, it was like, okay, well, if I just lock in on training, if I continue to focus on this, eventually this will all go away. And it's, you know, I, 
I equate it with like running, you know, running with a sprained ankle or running with, you know, a fracture, like you're not going to outwork the injury until you take the time to focus the attention on it and really get to the root of what is the problem and what do I have to do to heal this problem so that I can move forward in a healthy way. Um, and so there were, you know, there was a lot that, that happened with me in 2019 and, you know, it, it was, it was a bit of an emotionally traumatic year, but what it, what it did was it created an environment where I no longer had a choice. Like I, I had to seek professional help. I had to go talk to a therapist because like I couldn't run from it anymore. And, um, you know, so over the course, you know, where, where I wound up was, um, a program that focused on, um, eating disorders. Um, somebody very close to me was going through a similar program and they knew some of the struggles that I had had with, you know, weight management I think mean, leading up to 2019, I had gained you know, quite a bit more weight. Um, and they said, you know, like, just go talk to somebody here, do the, you know, you have to do the intake interview. They'll tell you if the program, if they think the program could benefit you. And if they don't think you're a good fit for their program, they have resources available to connect you with somebody who can help you. And so kudos to that person, you know, that is like probably some of the best, most life-changing advice I could have been given. Um, so I sat down and I did the, the intake, the intake interview and, you know, really gave myself a chance to be vulnerable with both myself in a way that I hadn't given myself permission to in a long time, but also with somebody else, you know, my, my thinking there was, you know, just like with training, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm either all in or I'm all out. Like if this is going to help me get better, I'm either all in or I'm all out. Um, and, you know, even in that short intake interview, you know, was kind of unpacking and, and talking about things that I had been, you know, actively avoiding thinking about for, for years. And it was, um, it was, it was relieving, but it was also eye opening to kind of let myself break down in that way and get in touch with, you know, okay, this is, this isn't okay. Like you're, you're hurting in a way you shouldn't have to, and there is help available, but it's going to be hard work. In that process of going through and unpacking the layers, so to speak, uh, where did endurance sport fit in? Because I think that a lot of athletes, uh, we get to a point, I've certainly gotten to the point where I question, is endurance sport filling my cup or is it doing the opposite? And is it causing uh, damage, right? Is it causing yeah. emotional harm because of, once again, this very structured nature that we tend to take or or the, even the, the, the abusive, the self-abusive nature of uh, inappropriately performing endurance sport where we deprive ourselves and push ourselves mm -hmm. to these limits. So wh where was endurance sport fitting in to you at that point? Was it taking away or was it adding? And how did you discover so that? At that point, it was it was really taking away. Um, you know, it was, you know, not just kind of the, the abusive aspects of like, how hard can I push on how little fuel, like, you know, it, you know, like how can I, how, how greatly can I mistreat myself and still perform and then not be happy with that performance? But also, I mean, just the, the negative self-talk and, you know, like, Hey, you had to drop by 1% on this, you know, this interval for three minutes. And I mean, that could sit and fester until the next workout, which hopefully I could perform, you know, at a hundred percent or 101 or 102. And it was in, in its own way, you know, my, my mind had turned, you know, what has become a healthy outlet now into something that it was just, it was ways to find things to weaponize against myself because I was so dissatisfied with so many aspects of who I had become and wasn't willing to, or just wasn't able to, maybe is a better way to put it, um, like get in touch with the underlying problem. It was just like, you should be stronger than this. You should be better than this. You can, you know, you can suffer through these workouts. You can suffer through these runs. Like you should just get better. And that's, mm -hmm. that's just not how it works. Oh yeah. That, that you should be able to do this thing is so common for a lot of us because somebody else does it or we hear about other people doing it. So therefore I should be able to do it, you know, or we mm -hmm. once did this. So therefore I should be able to do this. Mm -hmm. That's tough. Uh, how, 
so so what was your next approach if you like and and how did endurance sport evolve then from you moving forward at this point of trying to resolve these issues in a healthy way yeah so it it was actually kind of it, it it brought itself to a head in kind of early to mid you know maybe the somewhere in the first quarter of 2019 um in that you know like you've talked about others have talked about like your body doesn't distinguish between types of stress. Um, you know, stress is stress. And so whether it's training stress, stress from work, emotional stress, like you can only handle so much. Um, and somewhere in, you know, the February to May timeframe, like I just, I hit a breaking point and like just could not bring myself to train and could not like really started to, to just kind of shut down and had to put it on the shelf, which was sad in its own way and kind of generated its own, little negative self-talk for a while because I still had, you know, all of the workouts in the training plan and I still had the race that I wanted to do in early June. And I had every intention of doing, um, but I just like, I reached a point where I could just could not bring myself to get on the bike and go or go for a run or like just do anything. I mean, it was, it was a really, I've learned now how to catch warning signs much earlier than that, but it's like, for me, at least that was a really big red flag that, you know, the, the depression that you've struggled with for so long is really flaring up in a big way. And it should have been a trigger for me to be kinder to myself, to really seek professional help a lot sooner. Um, but I, I didn't know how to be kinder to myself at that time. And, you know, the other, you know, kind of the, the apathetic side of depression is not always telling you, you should get help unless you know to trigger on it. How, where did you move on from there, from this, this rock bottom where you recognize the fact that you needed to give yourself the time because you were dealing with enough. Uh, you didn't need to add in extra stress where, what was the evolution from that point forward? So, um, you know, started, I started, did the intake interview and then, you know, there's the schedule until you're able to meet with your therapist. So there was a, you know, a period of a few weeks in there where, um, you know, I couldn't really do anything, but I was at least on a path to do something like had the appointment scheduled in there. Um, the, the Bora Epic, the mountain bike race that I, I like to do in June that that happened. And, you know, kind of despite my better judgment, I was like, I just have to go do this because I need to get, I need to change the scenery. I need to do something new. Like this means too much to me to skip it, knowing that there was a risk that if this is an absolute disaster, um, that could have much bigger negative consequences. And, you know, as, as the universe sees fit, it was an absolute disaster. Um, the, oh. you know, no heat, ac- I hadn't, you know, I hadn't done anything with heat acclimation and the temperatures here in that part of the year can vary from, you know, the forties to the nineties and we were nineties and very humid oh. and I survived. I, like, I got to the end, but it was just like, it was, it was dark and, it was a really hard, I mean, it's a race, but it was a really hard journey to finish because it was just, you know, just completely overwhelming. And, um, you know, on the, on the drive home, it was, you know, it was like, I need to put this on pause for a little bit and really focus on, you know, understanding what is the healing journey and and where is that going to take me? And then when I start to have, the emotional capacity to, to think about training again, I, I need to ease back into that. And it may, you know, maybe it's just unstructured free rides to reconnect with the why, but, um, mm. you know, that was, that was how I got to that place. And then, you know, as I started working with the therapist and we started unpacking a little bit, a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the goings on under, you know, under, underneath it all, you know, I started to feel that little bit of bandwidth and that's, that's kind of the, the path that it took was, you know, going back in and, you know, just once a week, get out and go ride a mountain bike once a week, you know, go for, you know, hitch up the burly and we're going to, we're going to ride to the cafe and we're going to get, uh, you know, get breakfast and have a coffee and then, and then ride home and go about our days. And so it was a really slow reintroduction just to biking. Didn't, you know, give any thoughts to triathlon. I just kind of wrote off the whole season for triathlon in 2019 um, and focused on getting better. And then, you know, as I had the bandwidth got back into, you know, maybe not following like a totally structured training plan, but just picked something like, I think it was 40 KTT where it's like, well, 
this is something I know I'm not good at. I don't have a race that I want to do, but at least I have workouts that as I have kind of the capacity to do it, I can jump in and I can work on these workouts and probably wound up missing most of them. Um, but really learn to be okay with that in that moment because I'd written off the season. I didn't have any races that I was planning for. And so the, you know, the objective of training for me was to figure out like, what, what do I need to do to heal? What do I need to do to, you know, experience kind of like a, you know, self-love almost. And what do I need to do to learn to appreciate me for who I am? And then from there, then start to understand like where does endurance sport fit back into, into everything. What a, what a change, profound change from the, the, I guess, dangerous uh, situation that we probably have all found ourselves in in some, in some one point or another, where we feel like once again, if one interval was 1% off, well, then you might as well have not even trained. Uh, you better make it up next time. You know, that's like the, the, the dangerous thoughts that we can fall into mm -hmm. in working with your therapist. I don't know if they had experience with endurance sport, um, or if they had an experience in working with clients that did endurance sport, but throughout this process, what did you learn about endurance sport with your therapist? I don't know if that, that, that makes sense that, that question, but, um, it, you know, it does. everybody probably has some sort of like coping mechanism or some sort of system or framework in their life, regardless mm -hmm. of whether it's endurance sport or not. So I'm sure they're familiar with that, but endurance sport is a unique one. So mm -hmm. did you learn anything throughout your discussions with them about this? I learned a lot. Um, it did, it did come up as I started to get back into training. So, um, the, the program that I was going through was for the treatment of eating disorders and the, you know, the one that I was getting help for was binge eating disorder, which I, you know, ignorantly hadn't even considered as a possibility. I mean, there's, you know, I think particularly I can speak only for myself, but you know, when I was kind of at my heaviest and, you know, very, or very close to my all time heaviest, like, you know, there it was always, it was all, I always looked at it as a perspective of like, well, it's, it's gotta be a self-control thing. It's gotta be a willpower thing. Like there, there was never, there was never a point where I was even willing to entertain the fact that like there could be an emotional component to this that left unaddressed guarantees I will not be able to be successful. Um, so the, the therapist that I was seeing, you know, all of our work was really focused around building um, healthier habits around food, around eating, around exercise. Um, so that was one of the, the challenging things that, um, that I faced right away in the program was, you know, you, you can't track no, no counting calories like that. We're, we're trying to, to get in touch. Like the, the idea was, you know, everybody's born with the innate ability to understand when they are hungry and when they have eaten enough to be full. And over time we're conditioned to lose touch with that. And so it was the, the, the entire practice was very focused on mindfulness and learning to get in touch with, you know, okay, if you're hungry, then you need to eat and, you know, just, you know, there's the distraction free, but like really take the time to savor the food, enjoy the food. It was, it was surprising the amount of ritual that was kind of built up around it, but it, it also got me in touch with cooking, which I, which I really enjoyed. And it, you know, we'd, we'd sit down and enjoy a meal together and, you know, I'd start to realize like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not hungry. I can stop. And that was, you know, as interesting as it was to me to go through it, like that was where a good portion of the weight loss really happened. Um, that I experienced was in this period of reconnecting and learning to be more mindful about my eating and more in touch with my food and dealing with the, you know, the, the, the emotional traumas that I was working through and, um, yeah, just building that, that healthier relationship. And then when I started training again, um, you know, I had to be, I didn't have to be, but I chose to be, you know, upfront and honest about that. And, you know, she said kind of early on, like I, I the place that I was going didn't have like a focus around endurance sport, but her son, my therapist's son happened to be um, a triathlete. And so she had a lot of familiarity with kind of what can go on with that. Um, and so it was like, yeah, it was, but it was, it, it had the risk of being a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. she also understood all of the negative sides of things that can come with that. And it was like, well, if you're getting benefit from this now, let's keep going. That's not the focus of our work at this moment, but we're going to come back and we're going to talk about that. And I really want to dig in and understand the program that you're following and the tools that you're using. And if they're not in alignment with the goals of this program, like we may have to talk about you not doing that 
while while you're working on your healing journey and potentially not going back to it if it's just not going to be compatible with you know keeping your mental health in a good place yeah so what were the inputs that you analyzed at that point like uh, the so, different things for that you that were um i guess driving you to change or encouraging you to train i should say um so all the things that whether it was um the training plan like you mentioned the mm-hmm. calendar the training like the events you had on your calendar content you were consuming all that stuff like did you analyze all of that stuff so no actually um as much as i love data and love analytics um that was one of the things we got into early on in the program was like stay out of the weeds in analyzing your own workouts at this point um you know that's just everything at that that stage is really focused on you know building up your mental health and whether you enjoy it or not things that can be counterproductive to that goal like you got to sacrifice it for a period of time and you know what i've actually found since then so that was in 2019 i stopped like really digging in and trying to analyze each set each interval you know what could i do different how was this um you know it was just okay i'm gonna you know i'm gonna go in because i like the feeling i get when i'm done with this workout you know i'm gonna do the workout and then I have to, you know, close the program down and put it away. It'll push to it'll push to Strava. It'll push to Garmin. It saves in Trainer Road. Like all the data is still there. I can come back and look at it someday. Um, but for now, I'm not going to. I'm going to leave the analytics at work. I'm not going to bring that into into my personal life and apply it to myself. And I actually have not gone back to a place where I really dig in and analyze. You know, ride by ride, workout by workout even race by race, like, you know, what were the power numbers? What were the heart rate numbers? You know, how does that compare to elevation? I mean, that's, I, I have kind of reached a point where like I can be okay not looking at the data because I, I get done with a workout and I, I know like that went really well. I'm, I'm happy with how that went and, you know, whether it's, um, you know, plan builder or now adaptive training saying like, here's the workout you need to do to hit your ultimate goal. It's like, well, I either completed it as prescribed and awesome. That's, going to get incorporated and I'm going to be working towards my ultimate goal. Or, you know, if I've missed it, it's like, well, I did I not sleep well enough? Did I not fuel well enough? Like there's, there's reasons other than, you know, my shortcomings as a human that are, are behind that. And I don't need to see data to know I didn't sleep well. And so I've, I've, mm-hmm. I was at a place where I had to get away from the analytics and I actually really have found that I like that place because I can I can get done with a ride and say I I enjoyed that and that was fun and I don't need to see numbers to tell me whether or not that was fun. Yeah, you know, part of me this question comes from a personal place of caring because in creating the podcast, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast, there are many topics that we discuss in it and I I try to think of many different perspectives. And I know that we share a lot of things that if a person was to take it and run with it, in many cases, it could become detrimental to them if it's not managed correctly. You could probably say that about training in and of itself. And I know that you are a podcast listener. So um, did you have to did you did you have to stop listening to the podcast because was it providing too much potential ammunition against yourself? I don't know if that makes sense. No, it, it does. Um, and I didn't. And it's it's probably some of the same you know, reasons that I didn't, you know, I think when we had a chance to talk about it, my therapist actually was, you know, we'll say supportive with an asterisk, as long as it's continuing to drive healthy behaviors and it's in line with the program, she was very supportive, but, um, you know, like, yeah, there's, there is content in there that could be, um, used by somebody in, in kind of the wrong headspace to weaponize against themselves, but there's actually a lot of really good quality content in there that was very aligned with, the, the mindfulness practices that they were teaching in the program. Um, you know, like if you're not feeling it, shut it down. Like it's not, you can come back another day, you can do another workout. It's possible to do more harm by trying to finish something that you're just not there for. Um, you know, prioritizing things like sleep, even just the, the amount of conversation there was around prioritizing thing, prioritizing recovery. Um, you know, like there, there's really, there's really healthy information in there. Even if you ask me to name the specific workout, there's no possible way I could do it. But, you know, and maybe I'm imagining it, but, you know, I, I remember seeing in that it, it was probably one of the VO2 max workouts, like, you know, test this. If, if, the, if it's not working, just shut it down. Like you can come back another day. I mean, it's just like embedded in there 
it to me it felt like a healthy roadmap to being successful in whatever your chosen sport is and so sharing those examples you know with the therapist to say like this is kind of the ecosystem of the program that i'm using you know she felt it was very aligned with what the goals of the the program we were working through were and was was supportive as long as i wasn't kind of taking the things that could be weaponized and choosing to weaponize them for myself right yeah that makes sense uh as you're moving forward through this process and you're starting to reintegrate time on the bike and even workouts where they're appropriate um i want to take some time to discuss how your understanding evolved with like ignoring the pain um so with training, you know, we have this like perspective that like, oh, like, you know, your problem is you're not ignoring the pain and that's why you gave up earlier. That's why you got dropped. That's why that happened. And that's an inner voice that probably exists within many of us that are listening to this, the where it's like, you weren't ignoring it. You weren't pushing through the pain. You weren't pushing past the pain. Earlier, you mentioned the fact that managing mental health is in some respects, similar to a physical injury that you need to give it the space that it needs and then move through it. So how did your understanding evolve of striving, of pushing against something difficult, which is inherently part of the training process? So I think before like really going through the program and before, you know, doing a lot of the work to kind of build a, you know, a healthier sense of, you know, what is endurance sport as a part of my identity um yeah like it it would have absolutely been like you just didn't if you had just been willing to you know suffer harder for longer everything would be fine um and i think the turning point for me was realizing that there's there's a difference between pushing through you know discomfort and pushing through pain like pain mm -hmm whether it's physical or emotional is like a very clear signal from your body that something is wrong and you need to stop and look at it and address it or it will get worse. I mean, you know, I think of the, you know, the occasional like bout of cramps that hit towards the end of the race. Like that's discomfort that you just have to push through it and you'll be okay versus like, I just had a big crash and you know, now it's excruciating to put weight on one leg. Like you shouldn't push through that. It's kind of the same thing. Like I had a really stressful day at work. I've had a really stressful week at work. Um, you know, that's, that's one thing. Like I would, I would equate that more in like the discomfort category. Like, well, there might be some emotional benefit of like, it was a, it was a rough day at work. I know I can nail this workout. I really need that sense of a victory and you get a benefit from that. But, the, you know, the other side of that, that I see is more, um, you know, I, I am struggling with depression or anxiety. I may not recognize that, but I, if I'm honest with myself, I might recognize, like, I haven't really, you know, felt much of anything, happiness, sadness, anything for, for months. And, you know, that's not something that you can just push through and, and expect it to get better. And just like recovery, is a super critical part of the training process. Like taking a break sometimes to address these mental health issues is, is equally important, at least, you know, in my experience, because if you don't take that break and you don't give yourself this, the same space that you would give any other aspect of training to, to finding a way to, uh, to address, you know, some emotional difficulties that you might be going through, like they, they're just going to get worse and worse and you're going to choose to ignore it. But eventually you, you can't ignore it anymore. Like there, you'll reach a breaking point. Just like, you know, if you had a, a fractured leg and you were trying to run a marathon, eventually you just wouldn't be able to run anymore and you would be forced to, to address the pain. It was, it was the same place that I reached. Like I could not push through these, you know, these emotional issues anymore. I couldn't hide from them. I couldn't run from them. I couldn't just grit, grit and get through them. I mean, it just, it ground everything to, to a halt. Mm. So in this, so you're, you're getting back through this process. You feel like you're getting to the point where you can probably ascertain between, okay, this is a good day where I'm just struggling against the workout and this is going to be a win. And then other days when it's like, no, I need to shut it down. And this is not a day where I need, I have enough stress coming from other zones. This is becoming, instead of pushing through the pain or pushing through discomfort, it's pushing through pain. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you, uh, 
I guess throughout this course of 2019 and then into 2020, the stressful year that it was for, for so many of us uh, dealing with everything else, have you, do you feel like you've gotten to a point where, um, where you manage a level of consistency that you once did with training? Or do you feel like it's, it's changed and forever you're in a better place with it that's perhaps less rigid? I'm just so, curious about where you've arrived. It's a, it's a little of both. Um, I think over, you know, over the course of 2020, I would jokingly, so late 2019, you know, I, I was by no means done with the program, but the, the work that I had done and the strides that I had made, like I, I was a different person entirely. And I actually like that person a lot more. So, uh, I'm very grateful for the work that I did, but, um, you know, I think the, the joke that I would always make in, you know, over the course of 2020 is being consistently inconsistent, right? Like there's going to be days that I miss a workout here and there, or maybe, you know, if it's like, well, you know, it's scheduled Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Thursday is just slammed. Cool. Well, let's make it Tuesday, Friday, Sunday, and we'll just, you know, we'll rearrange things and make it work. Like giving myself the space with, you know, the flexibility to re even just rearrange a calendar. I think prior to going through this, it was very much a mind space of no, that these workouts are prescribed for Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. They have to happen on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. If I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning, I had better be able to perform. And, you know, over the course of 2019, by the end of 2019, it was like, well, I don't make my living doing this. It's something that I enjoy and it's something that I get a good physical benefit from. It's something I get a good emotional benefit from. But if I'm not going to get either of those from this specific workout, I shouldn't do it. And I need to give myself that flexibility to, well, we'll just push it a day. And maybe it means I have two days in a row. Maybe it means I push the next workout a day as well. Or, you know, when, when we're mixing in running and swimming, just can I rearrange things to fit everything in, but maybe not on the exactly prescribed schedule that was set potentially months ago when none of what is happening right now could have been known. Um, mm. And so, yeah, like the consistently inconsistent is, you know, like I'm going to do the best I can to hit as many of the marks as I can. And if I miss one, that's okay. If I miss two, that's okay. That must've been a really bad week. And I have to recognize that for what it is. Um, but if I'm missing, you know, even one in a row, like, is that a trigger to check in and say, okay, well, is this discomfort or is this pain? Is there something more going on here that I need to, to dig into and understand and address, or is it just a really rough week and, and it's okay to have those. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt it is. Uh, we can't expect ourselves to be robotic and, and, and perfectly rigid, you know? Um, so one of the things I, uh, yeah, I just, I, um, I think it's super important that we've reached, I, I don't want to promote so hard. I'm sorry, everybody, but I think that's what adaptive training is really helpful with. So uh, it's exciting. Uh, I want to talk about where you've kind of arrived now. Um, you, you've been able to manage your, your weight more successfully, um, mm -hmm. without making, you know, without all of the damaging side effects that you can do just to, even just emotionally speaking, uh, to yourself, that's, it's always really tough. You've been able to train consistently and even uh, perform well in some events. Did you do Bora Epic this year? I did. Um, so this year was the, the best I've ever done it. It, like it's an entirely different race when you're even, you know, so, I mean, just for context, like I finished in you know, a little over four hours. So it was, you know, kind of more the middle of the pack, maybe the front half of the middle of the pack by no means chasing the front, but in, you know, 2019, when I did it, it was a, you know, six and a half or seven hour ordeal in 2018. When I did it, it was a five to six hour ordeal. So like knocking, you know, an hour to two and a half hours off of previous performances. Like, I mean, that felt really good, but even getting to the end and like, oh, there's people at the finish line and there's stuff to do at the finish line. Cause you're not like rolling in and the only people left are the timekeepers watching their watches going like, come on guy, let's get out of here. We got stuff to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, like that. And you know, the, even within that ride, like the, the finishing time was great and I, I couldn't be happier with that. But the, the experience along the way of like being able to go out, you know, probably harder than I've ever gone out before. But, you know, looking down at, you know, my watch on my bars and going, okay, well, this is, this is with how, this is perfectly in line with how I'd planned to pace this. You know, I had IF on, as a screen on the bottom to, to manage to that. And I was like, okay, nice. well, I'd planned to go out for the first X amount of time at like a, you know, a, a 0.9 to 0.95. I wanted to stay at 0.8 to 0.85 until, you know, about midday. 
And it's, once I got through the halfway point, we were going to be in the hottest part of the day. And then it's just whatever you can do to keep rolling, <laughs> keep rolling. Yeah. But like sandbag on the front end to get as much out of the way as you can before it gets hot. Um, sure. And I mean, it was it was I don't know, for me, it was just such a different experience. So like I'm, I'm actually passing people going up the hill and it's sticking um, or you know, in the, in the back half of the race where, you know, there's, I mean, they're by no means are they like long climbs, you know, in the, in absolute terms, but for the area that are on the course, at least there's some of the longer climbs. It's like, I can just feel, feel the heat bill. Like my legs were getting hot and, mm. you know, you crest the top of the hill and it's like, I can click up a gear and I can keep rolling and spin it up and mm. feel things cool down. And, you know, like it just having power on tap, like all the way to the end was such a different experience. And, um, you know, it, it, it made it a lot more enjoyable. I had, you know, I had a lot of fun in 2018 when I did it. And I mean, that was a, you know, it was a, practically a duathlon with the amount of time I spent walking, um, yeah. to get to the, you know, to get a solid last place finish. But I mean, it, you know, it was just, it was a totally different experience, uh, this year. Um, had, had to have felt so good to have this thing where you, you have this extremely valuable tool that you love and enjoy, which is cycling. Um, and to go through this really challenging period where you're building so much awareness about how to, how to, um, how to love yourself and how to, uh, manage mental health, but then to know that you can still do that activity with this mm -hmm. new approach that you've been able to achieve in your life that just had to end to be able to achieve within that, with that activity had to feel incredible. It, it did. And I mean, you know, like not to, to, to bang on a drum that I feel like it's banged on a lot, but to, you know, do that with the liberating experience of being able to enjoy carbohydrate while doing it and not have to starve yourself to get through it. Like what, what a game changer that was to, you know, actually have like a, you know, a hydration and nutrition plan and not feel like, well, this is somehow going to be detrimental to every goal that I have. If I consume a single calorie over the course of a four hour race, like, I mean, that's, it's, it's the the place that I'm in now looking back at where I was where I was is so foreign to me now it it feels like if I were looking the other way like from that you know restrict 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 and then looking at like no we're gonna you know we're gonna eat at least 360 calories an hour and take in you know a ton of sodium and a ton of water and like really give give ourselves what we need to be successful like that is equally foreign if I were back then looking mm. forward yeah yeah it's a much better place to be in, that's for sure. Um, what tips would you give us endurance cyclists on how to continue to engage in endurance sport and cycling, but to do so in a healthy way? Kind of like closing tips that you would give us. Maybe perhaps another way to phrase this is things that you found most helpful for yourself in managing mental health while being an endurance athlete. I mean, I think probably the biggest thing is um, – be kind to yourself and be forgiving of yourself when you don't perform the way that you would expect. Um, I would, I would wager that most people that are going to hear this don't make their paycheck as a cyclist and odds are really good that the folks that do that are really successful, they have that approach of, you know, if this workout isn't going well, if this training session isn't going well, that's indicative of something else that may need to be addressed. It's not indicative of, you know, me failing as a person or me being terrible at this activity that I enjoy. Um, and, you know, kind of building on that, don't lose touch with your why. Like, why do you ride? What, what drew you to the sport originally? What, what about the sport brings you joy? Um, and if you lose touch with your why, at least I found it, it just, it, it sapped all the joy from it and it just became another responsibility, another chore and another thing that I was at risk of learning to hate and, and losing what was a source of joy in my life. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Those are fantastic tips uh, to help us all keep perspective and still do this, this awesome thing that we love, which is endurance sport. Um, man, this is James. Thank you so much. I feel like this has been a really a super helpful conversation for me personally, and I'm sure it has been for others. So selfishly, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thanks for having it with me. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for taking the time and and you know being open to to giving me the voice. And you know, thank you guys for for everything that you do. You're you're fantastic people, and and everybody that I've had the opportunity to interact with has been just absolutely wonderful.
Oh, thanks. Yeah. Appreciate that. It's uh, genuinely our pleasure. So, um, for all those that are listening to this, if, if, if you've received value from this, you can also rate this podcast or share it with other friends, people that need this and let people know that this could be something that could really help them. Uh, that could be a great way to be able to make this world a better place through this podcast. Right. Uh, and also if you can share your story, I bet you can help somebody as well. Uh, and you can do that once again at trainroadcom slash SAP. And we would love to hear from you. So, uh, with that all said, thanks a bunch, James. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, is there a good way to do so? I don't know if you're active on social media or anything else like that. Yep. Um, primarily use Instagram. Um, Switchback James is my handle on Instagram. And then uh, the James on the Trainer Road Forum. I'm frequently on both places. Fantastic. All right, James. Thanks a bunch. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon.